Oh, I shall be pleased when we get proper coffee again. Mm. And have you heard anything from your brother? Yes, I've heard he's in the front at the moment. Have you had a letter from him? Not at the moment. Oh, that must be a worry for your mother. Indeed. Yeah. I saw your mother at the knitting circle. Yeah, we, we've been knitting for the troops. Mm. Uh, and she that. said that you'd got a job. Yeah, I um, got a job at the ammunitions factory making the ammunition. Oh, that's a big help for the troops to have some ammunition that works. Have you seen that, that man over there? The lad over there? I wonder why he's not in uniform. I saw him earlier, maybe... I thought maybe he's on leave. <coughs> Excuse me? Yes? Uh, are you on leave? Because you're not in uniform. I'm not actually, but I'm only 17. Definitely. Do you reckon he's one of these that's mm. dodgy? Definitely. Tell you what, some of my friends at the church have been handing these out to show they're disgusting. I think we should give that young man one on our way out. They're for people who are too cowardly to fight. I don't think I want to stay in this cafe any longer with the likes of him around. Do Me you? neither. Oh, no. Let's go, shall we? I'll take that from you, dear. You should be ashamed of yourself. Jingo woman, how I dislike you. Dealer in white feathers, insulter, self-appointed. Of all the men you meet not dressed in uniform, when to your mind, a sorry mind, they should be the test, the judgment of your eye, that wild, infuriate eye, whose glance, so you declare, reveals unerringly who's good for military service. Oh, exasperating woman, I'd like to wring your neck, I really would. You make all women seem such duffers. Besides exemptions, enforced and held reluctantly, not that you'll believe it, you must know, surely, Men there are, and young men too, physically not fit to serve, who look in their civilian garb quite stout and hearty, and most of whom, I'll wager, have been rejected several times. How keen, though, your delight, keen and malignant. Should one offer you his seat in crowded bus or train, thus giving you the chance to say in cold, incisive tones of scorn, No, I much prefer to stand, as you, young man, are not in khaki. Heavens, I wonder you're alive. Oh, these men, these twice-insulted men, what iron self-control they show, what wonderful forbearance. But still, the day may come for you to prove yourself as sacrificial as upbraiding. So far, they are not taking us. But if the war goes on much longer, they might. Nay more, they must. When the last man has gone. And if and when that dark day dawns, you will join up first, of course, without waiting to be fetched. But in the meantime, do hold your tongue. You shame us, women. Can't you see it isn't decent to flout and goad men into doing what is not asked of you? Cheer up, mother, you needn't There's a good time coming by and by. Ringing gaily as the sun goes down, though your heart is aching 
I've always been fascinated by history and when Shoebox Theatre announced that they were doing a World War I event last year I was keen to get involved. When I was little my grandmother told me stories about her uncle. I want to tell everybody about conscious objectors like my great uncle Frank Price. He was not running away from conflict, rather he wanted to go to the front and gave his life for king and country and that is important. Frank Price worked in a bank in Birmingham. He was a conscientious objector who nevertheless wanted to go to the front. So he joined up with the second of the second London Field Ambulance and was sent to drive ambulances in Belgium. He was driving his ambulance home one evening with a nurse and four passengers in the back when his ha ambulance hit something. It may have been an a unexploded shell or it may have been a mine but nonetheless whatever it was it went bang and it killed all of them. Frank Price his nurse and the four passengers in the back. They would have been wounded men. I don't know where he was buried immediately, but I do know that later on he was buried at Menin Road South Cemetery in Belgium near Wipers. I also was able to find out the plot number in which Frank Price was buried in Menin Road South Cemetery and if I were to go there now I'll, using the plot number I'll be able to find his grave. We found it in the British War Graves archives on computer. So we met George at the Tamworth Library as part of the World War One project and he was interested in finding out about his father's part in World War I. What he found was this period where his father didn't get paid as a soldier and he was he was he couldn't find out the why that had happened. And then we when we finally did find out what had happened, it was because he'd been made a prisoner of war by the Germans and the British government obviously didn't feel it was worth paying him during that time of of uh, convalescence. <laughs> okay. George had told us about this uh, soldier that he'd found in the British Legion and I think he said his name was Holtman or, or Hartman or something. Anyway we tried to research this on computers at the library and we couldn't find him anywhere and then we found finally we came to this name that we thought this this one keeps coming up but it it bore no resemblance to the name that he gave us, and it was Coltman. During his service he received the Military Medal and Bar, Distinguished Conduct Medal and Bar, and the Victoria Cross. Lance Corporal William Coltman was born in Burton. He was a conscientious objector, answered call-up, and was posted to the front. Then he told his commanding officer he didn't want to fight and became a stretcher bearer. He was 26 years old when he received the VC and he went through the whole war without firing a shot. During the operations at Mannequin Hill in October 1918, Lance Corporal Coltman, a stretcher bearer, hearing that wounded had been left behind during a retirement went forward alone in the face of fierce fire, found the casualties, dressed them and on three successive occasions carried comrades on his back to safety, thus saving their lives. 
This very gallant NCO tended the wounded unceasingly for 48 hours. I was speaking to my friend about the project and he, he informed me that he had an uncle that had won the VC and I said, is, is that true John? He says, says yes, I says yes it's, it's true, I, says, I bet you can find something on the internet about it. So I, I did the usual Google search, I thought I have a fat chance of finding anything here and then I typed in, in the name and everything. And there he was, bold as brass, massive picture of, of him, as a cigarette card. Uh, so Charles Ernie Scarforth was quite famous in his time, famous enough to be a cigarette card. And uh, his story of how he got the VC is quite incredible. Um, and I couldn't understand John's modesty <laughs> over it, to be honest. So. He got his VC because he pulled his sergeant from under a dead horse that had been shot by the Germans. Uh, and if that wasn't enough, the next day he did something very similar. A, a horse had fallen, his sergeant was trying to escape from the horse, and he managed to draw the fire away from his sergeant, thus his, his sergeant got away. And then he was caught by the Germans and uh, was a prisoner of war till the end of the war. Well, we all met at the library, at Tamworth Library, and um, we were going to use the computers for the research, which I found um, quite difficult at first. Um, World War One is a very large topic, and um, I was a bit nervous about finding things on the computer, because I usually end up losing things. Uh, Margaret suggested to me that I had a look at the BBC website on the news items about the First World War, and, and I came across a really interesting article about uh, some men that had been shot at dawn after court-martial and uh, then later posthumously pardoned. And I thought this one might be an interesting topic to pursue. I was able to find the book in the library that the news item had um, referred to. And um, luckily there was um, some articles in the book about um, soldiers from the South Staffs Regiment. I found two uh, individuals, uh, a Private Botfield and a Lance Corporal Hawthorne, who had both um, been court-martialed. And uh, there was an interesting story about the background that led up to um, their trial and, um, and the outcome, which unfortunately was that they were both shot. I shared the story with the group, the uh, drama group, of the two soldiers and uh, together we worked on a, a reenactment of their stories. So we rehearsed these sketches and put them all together and they formed part of a performance at the assembly room. We went along to an open day at Whittington Barracks um, just to get a bit of atmosphere about World War I and the trenches and uh, then we had the idea that perhaps it would be nice um, to make a film of the, uh, of the trench uh, scenes. And uh, then we had the idea that why don't we make a film of the whole project. <laughs> 